Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2016. And here's a quick look at what's coming up. Tonight, we look at possibly the biggest drug smuggling operation in history. The Clintons and Bushes, stronger together, with their ties to MENA, Arkansas, and Iran-Contra. This criminal enterprise, exposed in the 1980s, continues to this day with the rape of Haiti. There are new accusations today of pay-to-play scandals rocking the Clinton campaign. And a flashback with a young Alex Jones talking to one of the whistleblowers exposing the Bush-Clinton drug connection. In the Air Force, I worked uh, directly with the FBI's counterintelligence division for three years. And then that led me into work, uh, contract work with the CIA in an obscure place called Mena, Arkansas. And here at home, Hillary hurls racism charges in Charlotte like a Molotov cocktail. Will she be held accountable for her reckless demagoguery? Of course not. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. What if I told you that two former U.S. presidents were once part of the largest drug smuggling operations in American history? You'd probably say I was one of those crazy conspiracy theorists, right? But wait a minute, I want you to take a look at this because there is compelling evidence that suggests that George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton were partners in crime and perhaps the most lucrative and brazen drug trafficking operations in the history of the international drug trade. And this goes all the way back to the 1980s after Bush Sr. was head of the CIA and then vice president and Bill Clinton was the governor of Arkansas. They worked hand in hand with the CIA, Oliver North and notorious drug smuggler Barry Seal to bring in what official IRS and DEA calculations, along with sworn court testimony, amount to $3 billion to $5 billion worth of drugs into the United States. And this was back in the 1980s, 1981 to 1985. What they did was set up an air base in Mena, Arkansas, where the CIA allegedly brought in plane loads of cocaine and heroin from Nicaragua to be sold in the U.S., much of which ended up in South Central Los Angeles, and thus the beginning of the crack epidemic. And for more on that, you can Google search our interviews with Freeway Ricky Ross. Now, this also has links to the Iran-Contra scandal, because a lot of that money that was made from the drug trafficking ended up in the hands of the Nicaraguan Contra rebels and also helped pay for illegal arms shipments to the government of Iran. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States. And then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Bolin Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was pri primarily a, a matter for federal jurisdiction. The state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it. And everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. Now that's a brave woman right there, independent journalist Sarah McClendon, asking President Bill Clinton about the CIA drug running operation in Arkansas while he was governor under his watch. And notice Bill Clinton, he never denied that it happened. He just said that he didn't have anything to do with it. And I think it's very interesting and rather suspicious that Barry Seal 
Two of his favorite drug trafficking locations were Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Mena, Arkansas. And it's widely accepted that Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards was paid off big time by Barry Seal to look the other way. But we're supposed to believe that Bill Clinton, as governor of Arkansas, was never bribed. And he had no idea what was going on in his own backyard. Right. Why is the life and death of Baton Rouge, Louisiana-born drug smuggler Barry Seal still relevant today? The revelations surrounding Seal's involvement with the vice presidency of George H. Bush, the Arkansas governorship of Bill Clinton, secret money laundering dealings with the DEA, and CIA Director William J. Casey's shadow government of the United States paints a clear picture of the evolution of the current corruption that infests the highest levels of government today. In a staff meeting in 1981 with newly elected President Ronald Reagan, CIA Director William Casey said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. In the mid-1980s, News Channel 8 reporter Teresa Dickey stumbled onto what would become a goldmine of investigative journalism when she innocently went to report on what appeared to be Governor Bill Clinton's new initiative to bring good jobs to the people of Arkansas. To her surprise, Teresa Dickey gradually uncovered a massive shadow government operation replete with illegal cargo plane modifications for drug running and money laundering that would have huge ties to the DEA. And at the center of that deliberate and illegal operation was Barry Seal, a fearless drug smuggler and gun runner for the DEA and the CIA. Seal had been busted for drug smuggling and worked out a deal with the DEA to act as an informant. But last night in Louisiana, Barry Seal's enemies caught up with him and killed him. Tonight, three men are in custody. NBC's Brian Ross reports that Seal was about to testify for the government once again. It was Seal who posed as a smuggler and flew into Nicaragua and took these pictures showing Colombian drug dealers and Sandinista officials loading cocaine on his plane. I came to the table with uh, a background in Air Force intelligence, uh, eight years during the Vietnam War, worked with the CIA uh, and Air America, and then that led me into work, uh, contract work with the CIA in an obscure place called Mena, Arkansas, uh, back when Bill Clinton was governor and back when George Bush was the president. And, uh, and I personally witnessed a complicity between these two, these two men, Bush and Clinton, in terms of uh, transporting cocaine into the U.S. Uh, for the purpose of sale to generate money to fight a war. And that, that war at the time was the uh, conflict in Central America involving the Sandinistas uh, in Nicaragua. And after the Iran-Contra hearings detailed Oliver North's diversion of funds to the Contras and all of the failed indictments indictments never brought anyone to justice. To this day, the banks continue to launder the billion-dollar drug cartel industry's money. And when they are caught, they pay a fine and no one goes to prison. Thank you, Clinton and Bush crime family. Corruption has been largely normalized. Although all of this evidence may seem irrelevant as the statute of limitations has been surpassed, what does it mean to the upcoming election? What difference at this point does it make? It, it means everything. It means innocent people mysteriously died in Arkansas for no reason. Because of Linda Ives' investigation into the death of her son, she was placed on Bill Clinton's enemy list by White House counsel Mark Fabian. Already, people associated with the case were beginning to die in what amounted to a reign of terror among young people in Alexander, Arkansas. The crime syndicate operating within the Bush and Clinton families will either be stopped dead in its tracks from entering the executive office once again, or a Hillary presidency will usher in a new age of corruption that will bring the United States to its knees. John Bound for Infowars.com. And for more on the MENA connection, David Knight joins us now to talk about the unholy alliance between the Bush and Clinton crime families. And no matter how the mainstream media spins this, David Knight, this is not a conspiracy theory because there's documented evidence that supports all this, even though 
Nine separate investigations were shut down. Tell us more about That's that. That's right. State and federal. That happened over a 10-year period. And, of course, Darren, uh, this all began back in 1986, in October, when a plane was shot down that was based out of Mena, Arkansas. Right. That was Barry Seal's plane that had been using to bring about half a ton of cocaine each month into Mena, Arkansas. And, of course, we had connections between Barry Seal and the DEA and the CIA. Look, you have to understand that the CIA's central funding for their black operations has been drug trafficking. That's been the situation that's been for decades. It was centered out of MENA. Many people believe that it's now centered out of Afghanistan, Turkey. Uh, but at that time, back in the 80s and the 90s, it was centered out of MENA, Arkansas. And when we look at these players, we have to understand it's not just even the Clintons and the Bushes that are still around today. We've also got people like Robert Gates who just stepped into the presidential election saying about Donald Trump that he was beyond repair on national security issues. To which Trump came back and of course Robert Gates was a Secretary of Defense under George W. Bush as well as Obama. He served two years under one, three years under the second. And Trump came back and said, well, I've never met former Defense Secretary Robert Gates. He knows nothing about me, but look at the results under his guidance. A total disaster. And he's right, our foreign policy under Gates, under Obama and Hillary Clinton and George Bush have been a total disaster. Yet Robert Gates goes back to Iran-Contra himself, Darren. Mm -hmm. He was the deputy CIA director at the time. And when William Casey died suddenly under kind of mysterious circumstances, he was supposed to testify in the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, the day before he was supposed to testify, the CIA doctor came by his office uh, examined him and said, uh, I think you've got a, uh, well, he had a couple of seizures, right? They took him in and he says, you've got a brain tumor. We're not going to do radiation. We must operate. Casey didn't want to uh, do an operation. He wanted to do radiation. They operated and he never talked again. He died a few months later. K uh, Robert Gates took his place as deputy CIA director, but because he was so tainted by Ron Contra, they knew they could not get him confirmed. So George H.W. Bush put in someone else. But as uh, or rather Reagan did, as soon as George H.W. Bush became president, Robert Gates became CIA director as well. So when we look at this, uh, the CIA really is kind of like this inside club. OK, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a club that uh, it's a big Donald club Trump, and yeah. we're not in it. That's right. Kind of mm -hmm. the uh, League of Extraordinary Drug Dealers is, is what I like to refer to it as. But. It's also concerning when we look at uh, Donald Trump talking to James Woolsey as somebody who's going to advise him on this. Because we have to understand that it was James Woolsey who was selling the attack on Iraq hours after 9-11. He supports torture. He wants to uh, uh, have the execution of uh, Edward Snowden. And, of course, he believes in climate change and wants to ban fossil fuels. So there's a lot of disturbing uh, factors with any of these CIA directors. But they all come back to connections in one way or the other to drugs. That's the common factor that we see with all of these people. To drugs, and I think it's very significant going back to the Iran-Contra scandal because yeah. how significant is this? The plane was called Fat Lady, right? And it was a C-123K cargo plane. It was owned by Barry Seal, and it somehow magically resurfaced after he was shot to death in Baton Rouge. And it was shot down over Nicaragua with a load of weapons headed, headed for the Contras. And this is what started the whole Iran-Contra scandal. If it wasn't for that plane being shot down, we might not have ever heard about it. That's right. And, of course, uh, when that plane was shot down, the pilot and the radio man uh, were killed. But uh, Hassan Fus uh, uh, parachuted out. He was captured by the Sandinistas that Reagan and the other people were fighting, the communist Sandinistas. He confessed at the time to being a CIA direct, uh, operative. And uh, then he later recanted that as the U.S. government got him out in just a few months, got him out of jail with the Sandinistas somehow. He'd been sentenced to 30 years in jail. But we keep seeing this recurring theme. I mean, we could just talk about the planes and how many times you see planes that are loading tons of cocaine and then alternating between that and rendition. Okay, we had uh, even 10 years later in uh, mid-2000s, 2006, we had a plane that uh, had to make an emergency landing in Mexico, loaded with tons of cocaine, and then the pilot and the plane disappear. Well, later we find out that they're doing renditions out of Mexico of people involved in the drug wars. A year later, a plane crashes loaded with tons of uh, cocaine. We learned that that plane had been used for renditions by the CIA for Gitmo prisoners. So there's always this recurring, uh, rotating door between drugs, 
guns, the CIA, and <laughs> these planes, as well as uh, the, the CIA directors who now are inserting themselves at every level into this current election. And now we know that the Bush family is going to vote for Hillary Clinton. Which no be, surprise. And, and that should be a big surprise. Well, it's probably a big surprise for a lot of people, but for those of us living outside of the matrix, yeah. no surprise at all. Um, you've often referred to Bill Clinton, and you talked about his relationship with your father and how it developed, and your mother as well, and he's your brother from another mother. <laughs> what does that make Hillary Clinton to the Bush family? <laughs> My sister-in-law. <laughs> Interesting. He thinks of George a little bit like the father he didn't have and he's very loving to him and i really appreciate that i love bill clinton may all the democrats forgive me this close to the election i love george bush i do so there you go the bush and clinton crime families go all the way back to the 1980s and now even more recently with the rape of Haiti in yeah. 2010. So, yeah. and, and you know, like we're supposed to expect, it's all gonna change if Hillary becomes president. No way, it'll continue. Now, we're gonna take a quick break right now, but when we come back, the MENA connection will continue. We're gonna have more on this as a very young Alex Jones. I think this is back in 2001. He interviews a former counterintelligence and CIA operative about his book, Compromised, Clinton, Bush, and the CIA. And you don't wanna miss this. We are breaking the matrix and exposing the Clinton and Bush crime families when the InfoWars Nightly News returns right after this. Did you know that a CIA contractor has gone public exposing Bill and Hillary Clinton's narcotics trafficking in Mena, Arkansas? That's right, his name is Terry Reed, best-selling author of Clinton Bush and the CIA. I interviewed him back in the year 2000. Mr. Reed wasn't just a CIA contractor, he was the head CIA contractor at MENA, Arkansas, training pilots working with the Clintons and the Bushes to fly cocaine out of Central America into the United States and fly weapons back in for the Contras. This is more important than ever because it's the Clintons that got the mandatory sentencing rules changed to give black Americans who use crack cocaine instead of powdered cocaine sentences of up to five times longer. Hillary Clinton herself has come out over and over again and said, look at what somebody tells you the first time. Look at what they stand for. Well, we know the Clintons what they stand for, and that's shipping narcotics into the United States that multinational banks launder. Now, here's an excerpt from my film, Police State to the Takeover, shot in 2000 with CIA whistleblower Terry Reid. Well, I came to the table with uh, a background in Air Force intelligence, uh, eight years during the Vietnam War, worked with the CIA uh, in Air America, and uh, so I know how the intelligence community functions, how it's organized, and after my discharge from the Air Force, I worked uh, directly with the FBI's counterintelligence division for three years, and then that led me into work, uh, contract work with the CIA in an obscure place called Mena, Arkansas, uh, back when Bill Clinton was governor governor and back when George Bush was the president and uh, and I personally witnessed a complicity between these two these two men Bush and Clinton in terms of uh, transporting cocaine into the US uh, for the purpose of sale to generate money to fight a war and that, that war at the time was the uh, conflict in Central America involving the Sandinistas uh, in Nicaragua uh, in 1970, it's well documented that uh, the organization that was flying the classified material for Air America, uh, codenamed Scatback, uh, was busted. This whole this whole fleet of airplanes and pilots was was busted for hauling heroin disguised as classified material in an attempt to smuggle that back to Hawaii. And if you get to Hawaii, then it's a free ride back to the United States because that's part of part of the United States. There's now, no customs to clear. That is documented there, but back to the absolute documentation. Tell us how you how you were involved in MENA with uh, then Governor Clinton of Arkansas and President Bush, who had also been director of the CIA earlier in the 70s. Uh, I met Oliver North in 1982. Uh, he was uh, with the National Security Council. He's the man who recruited me 
as a civilian to get involved in the contra resupply operation. Uh, he told me that this was taking place in, in Mena, Arkansas, that uh, George Bush was overseeing the, the entire project uh, in order to insulate uh, the executive branch from the uh, from the scheme because certainly there were constitutional considerations there. Uh, I went to Mena. I met a man named Barry Seal, who I was told was the CIA contractor who had the contract to resupply the Contras. Uh, sure, in fact, I found a large base there under construction. Uh, I was hired. Uh, initially to be a flight instructor. I'm a certified flight instructor. My last tour of duty in Southeast Asia was to assist the Cambodians and equip them to fight a covert war. And uh, here we were doing basically the same kind of training. Uh, this time we were equipping Nicaraguans to fight communism in Central America. And did you ever actually see the cocaine or you just were at the base and knew that it was oh, no, being flown I, in? No, I, after uh, after walking around with uh, blinders on for two years, it became to the point I could no longer deny what was going on. And uh, as I document and discuss in my book, Compromised, it's a book I wrote about this subject, uh, Compromised Clinton, Bush, and the CIA. Uh, in 1987, I came face to face with a C-130 full of cocaine, just literally tons of it stored in ammunition boxes on a flight that was returning. And from that point on, uh, you know, I, I couldn't deny it, and I asked for a full-scale investigation and went directly to Oliver North, I might point out, to, uh, to request for that to occur. And uh, the investigation obviously didn't happen. I was labeled a uh, security risk and a threat to the operation, uh, which clearly showed to me that this was uh, being sponsored and sanctioned by the U.S. government. So they were flying guns out and coke in? Yeah. The story. Also? I have no, I, I had no knowledge of that. It was cocaine. Where are we going now today? Would you say that the majority of... How big a percentile of the narcotics coming into this nation are controlled by the National Security Agency or the CIA? I have no way of knowing, but I use logic on these kinds of scenarios. Uh, if, if you are to believe the Pentagon, and I do, we have a security net over this country, down-looking satellites and radar that is designed to stop as small of an incoming target as a surface, as an air-to-ground missile launched from a Soviet MiG out of Cuba. Now, if that's the case, and, and you can do that, and I believe we can do that, that's been proven time and time again we can, uh, you have to ask yourself, how are all these drugs getting into this country? So what are the drug busts that we see? Are those cowboys or people that were not inside who are not licensed drug runners for the CIA being busted? Oh, the independent, the entrepreneurs, the, the little guys, the guys with a Cessna that gets caught with a duffel bag full and goes to prison for life. The juxtaposition of that is a C-123 with uh, five tons <laughs> coming in unabated. So. How do we stop this? Just education? No. We, uh, we, the American people, first of all, say we don't want a war on drugs. I'm for total legalization of drugs. Well, uh, some people will be shocked by that, that back in the 1920s during Prohibition, alcohol abuse skyrocketed. It created giant armed gangs. If you make something illegal and risque, a giant black market rises. Well, black market is what the problem is. The profits are there. Uh, take the profit out. And then it loses the flair and it loses the money. <laughs> Not only does it lose that, but anybody else still in the trade certainly surfaces as a cold sore real, real abruptly. The banks that launder the money uh, would surface and probably go bankrupt. It'd be interesting as, a, as an experiment. I've always said to uh, let's let's say we're not going to do this permanently, but for for three months, for 90 days, we're going to have a test, and we're going to legalize cocaine for 90 days, and just see the reaction of corporations, companies, big businesses that are in the drug business, and banks that launder the proceeds, and watch them surface because they could not, they would go into withdrawal. <laughs> Real abruptly. Well, Mr. Reed, just two more short questions, and I appreciate your time with us here today. The general public 
has a gut level feeling that the information you're, you're discussing is true. Even Esquire did a large article two months ago um, about it in their September issue, um, documenting it, DEA people, carte blanche admitting it. And we've seen articles in early 97 about the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and San Antonio being caught with $3 billion of drug money. This goes to the highest levels. Truthfully, it's good to say we should decriminalize drugs. At the same point, isn't the war on drugs also creating the police state that they like? That's my greatest concern. I don't say let's legalize drugs because I want to see you use drugs or anybody else. Uh, we have not had a war on drugs. We've had a war on our Bill of Rights under the guise of the war on drugs. Uh, I never thought I'd ever live to see the day in this country that I fought for to have roadblocks, arbitrary roadblocks. Now, passengers and vehicles have no rights, as you know, that the passenger has an obligation to show his or her identification. Asset forfeiture seizure. In my view, Hillary and Bill's Achilles heel is the fact that they're really cold-blooded CIA arms and drug traffickers who could care less about black people, white people, you name it. And that's why we're releasing this September surprise in hopes that Americans investigate the very, very wicked past of this dynamic duo. InfoWars has more information coming out in the days and weeks that exposes uh, this Bonnie and Clyde's criminal activities. But this is a very important September surprise. We need to get all Americans, people around the world, quite frankly, to look into the history of this dangerous criminal combine that is the Clintons. Why is the mainstream media calling the rioters in Charlotte, North Carolina, protesters? These aren't protesters. These are agitators and criminal thugs after the shooting of an an armed black man by the name of Keith Lamont Scott, who was shot, by the way, by a black police officer. Rioters once again jumped to conclusions and went crazy before hearing all of the facts. But hey, once they do learn all of the facts, you can bet that the riots will continue. Because facts don't matter to Black Lives Matter. Joe Biggs joins us now. He's en route to Charlotte, North Carolina. Joe, what's the latest on the riot situation? Hey, I just landed in Charlotte. And, you know, from what a lot of people have told me so far that live in the uptown area is that it kind of looks like the Gaza Strip. I mean, the National Guard's in town. They're actually checking people's IDs. If you don't actually live in that uptown area or have proof that you work in that area, you're not allowed to be out there. But the thing is, no one's going to be there tonight rioting anyways. Everyone's going to the rich white neighborhood where most of the NFL players live, which is called South Park Meadows. And that's where I'm going to be focusing most of my attention tonight. Well, I know there's been reports and we've seen the violent unrest, looting, attacking bystanders, they're attacking journalists, they're setting fires, you know, the usual suspects. And they're, they're smashing up cars, smashing up businesses and shooting at each other. But the media is still describing these criminal thugs behind the rampage as protesters. And, hey, I've got news for all you protesters. Martin Luther King would be ashamed. Yeah, they're not protesters. When you're burning down your city, when you're demolishing jobs, when you're destroying people's livelihoods, when you're attacking people and assaulting people, you are a terrorist. All right, well, look, I want to tell our audience just to stay tuned for updates. You will be reporting tonight and putting out reports on Infowars.com. Also, check out the Alex Jones channel on YouTube and the official Alexander Emmerich Jones Facebook page. Joe Biggs, you got the last word. I will be using uh, Alex's Facebook mentions tonight, and I will be uh, posting videos of YouTube and stuff on my Twitter. So live and, coverage uh, as well. Live coverage yep. as well. That's right. Stay tuned for more reports at Infowars.com. I'm Joe Biggs from right. Charlotte, North Carolina. All right, buddy. Stay safe out there. All right. Later, dude. Article up on Infowars.com right now by Clifford Cunningham. New York bomber 
tied to CIA's Al Awalaki. That's right, Ahmad Khan Ramani's manifesto actually praised the known CIA asset Anwar Al Awalaki, as well as numerous trips to Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is breaking news right now on Infowars.com. This manifesto that Ramani actually posted ended up mentioning the Boston bombing as well as Yemeni American born cleric Anwar Alalaki, who was the first U.S. citizen to actually be killed by a U.S. drone strike when he was in Yemen. Al Awalaki, he was a known CIA and FBI asset who dined at the Pentagon shortly after 9-11. He directly inspired the Chattanooga shooter, the Fort Hood shooter, the underwear bomber, as well as the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attacks. Paul Joseph Watson called him the chief terrorist pansy handler for the CIA. He is the federal government's premier false flag agent. So what we have here is a situation where the New York bomber is actually tied to someone who is deeply involved in trying to destroy America. When he was living, he was the chief terrorist and he continues to inspire despite his death. It's a very, very shocking and it's very, very disturbing. Disturbing. Now, I agree with Trump when he says that we need to have extreme vetting. There's another article up today on Infowars.com where actually Donald Trump is being lambasted by CNN for saying that he wants to vet all of the people who are coming into America. The fact of the matter is this, if you don't vet people, then how will you know if they're friends of America or if they're coming here to actually destroy our country? If you do not actually go forth and look for people who do have ties to terrorists and who are ready to destroy destroy America, then how are you actually going to protect the security of America? Hillary Clinton does not want that. Hillary Clinton wants to double, triple, quadruple the amount of terrorists, the amount of unvetted refugees quote refugees that are coming into America. She wants to be the Angela Merkel of America. I'm not with her. I want you to go ahead and check out this special report by Clifford Cunningham on Infowars.com. In order to stay up to date, we've actually created a new app. It's found at the Infowars.com website, Infowars.com forward slash app. There you can download it and you can actually keep up to date with everything that's going on right now. It's a very contentious election. There's many, many terrorist attacks happening every day and we want you to stay up to date. Just go ahead and download infowars.com forward slash app and stay tuned for more special reports. This is Ashley Beckford for infowars.com. I'm Margaret Halb reporting for Infowars.com. Well, if you want to know about all the countries that Hillary Clinton has single-handedly destroyed, look no further than our website, Infowars.com. There's an article up online right now. It's trending, written by Wayne Madsen. Wayne's going to be on Alex Jones' show later today and then the nightly news uh, tonight with Owen Schroyer. I want to take you through what he said. I encourage you to take a look at this 11-page article in its entirety. It's amazing. Uh, it's entitled, Here's a Handy Chart of Clinton's World Destruction. And then he goes on to write about what uh, what uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell had written about Hillary Clinton. He basically said everything she touches turns to you know what. He said she screws up everything with hubris. And then Madsen gives this brilliant detailed list of every country that she's been involved in and single handedly what she's done to them. You know, Madsen talks about as, as uh, Clinton, as Secretary of State, she threatened Belarus, Ecuador, Bolivia, Cuba, Somalia, Uzbekistan, and Peru with recriminations if they recognized a state that she was trying to ignore. Uh, he talks about her involvement in Libya, the gun aspect of what she did on the ground in Libya, what she's done in Syria, and what her actions have done that have led to the creation of ISIS. So we're talking about a woman that is on a major power trip right now. She wants the, the highest office in our land, and yet look at her track record. She screws up 
everything she touches. Can you only imagine the foreign policy regime that we're going to have if she gets her hands on the keys to the White House? Now, Wayne Matson goes on to talk about how Clinton's involvement in the Arab Spring resulted in the rise of Sunni Wahhabism and the Islamic State. Basically, she had a hand in the creation of ISIS in northern and western Iraq and Iraq's plunge and dissension into hell. He goes on to talk about in 2009 her involvement in Kosovo, uh, which led to the state increasingly becoming a state ruled by criminal syndicates and terrorists and former uh, Liberation Army officials, which we know were basically terrorists. So we need to take a look at Hillary Clinton's record. She has a lengthy past full of crimes. I encourage you, go to our website, take a look at this article. While you're at it, download our app, Infowars.com forward slash app. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. Right now on Infowars.com, Hillary Clinton has denied any need for a neurocognitive test. ABC reporter Serena Fazan asked Hillary Clinton if she would take a neurocognitive test. The first time Hillary Clinton responded awkwardly by saying, you know, I'm very sorry I got pneumonia. A strange response to being asked if you need a neurocognitive test. Now, when she was asked again, she said there's no need for that. Now, Serena Fazan might just be looking out for Hillary's health. This is a, a regular thing for women of her age that have experienced the things that we've seen her experience. But she says there's no need. And then she even cites her health records, how they were released. But, you know, Hillary, in case you didn't notice, there were multiple doctors that came out and questioned those releases. They questioned those reports, diseases that didn't exist. Um, you've got tests done to you that also don't exist. So a lot of questionable things here, but why won't Hillary take a neurocognitive test? Maybe Trump says he will. Will that force Hillary to do it? I'm not sure, but right now, I think she's covering something up. For more on this story, go to Infowars.com. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com, and I am joined by Wayne Madsen of WayneMadsenReport.com, also of Infowars.com. Now, Wayne, you put out a scathing article on Infowars.com today detailing Hillary's uh, destruction around the entire planet. Um, you know, briefly, just tell us about the overall arching kind of spectacle that you've seen with Hillary Clinton involved around the world. Well, she's on the same level with Henry Kissinger and Madeleine Albright as being uh, one of the three worst secretaries of state in U.S. history, <laughs> and that, of course, covers a lot of uh, ye many years. Uh, but I, I looked at, uh, you know, we, we saw Obama at the U.N. talking about all these trouble spots. These were trouble spots created by Hillary Clinton's uh, terrible policies as Secretary of State. Her, her regime change, uh, which she called responsibility to protect, uh, resulted in failed states in Ukraine, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen. Uh, it furthered the destruction uh, and dismemberment of Iraq. I mean, that started with Bush, but was continued because of Clinton's uh, bad policies. And, uh, and we've seen um, a coup d'etat in Honduras. She wasn't even secretary for very long before she authorized uh, the military overthrow of the democratically elected president of Honduras. And that was followed by more chicanery and skullduggery throughout Latin America. Yeah, and speaking of uh, Latin America and, and South America, let's go case by case on some of these. In Argentina, um, you know, and these are her foreign policies. It's very important we, we, that people know that these are her foreign policies that caused this. Um, there was fomenting of political and labor protests uh, that caused uprising. And eventually uh, what was um, an economy on the rise is now once again back in a collapsed state. And, and now they're trying to pay off the IMF and they can't afford to, Wayne. That's right. Uh, Argentina has a bad history of being... Uh, in you know, uh, uh, under the dictates of the IMF and World Bank, and once again because uh, she undermined uh, the uh, Kirshner government, Cristina Fernandez uh, Kirshner government, uh, and and uh, her successor lost the reelection in in probably a, uh, one of these Soros-engineered 
uh, minor flips where you only move about a percentage point and the uh, victor victory goes to the uh, other candidate. But now, yes, Argentina has a uh, basically a fascist president who's uh, put the country back under uh, the draconian dictates of the IMF. And uh, we see the Argentine, not, uh, not only the economy collapsing, but we see capital flight uh, in a huge way leaving the country. Also in Ecuador, the country was starting to blossom. People were starting to experience some wealth being shared uh, throughout the citizens. And then Hillary Clinton came in and a police co-op um, came down and then the economy collapsed. Another example of a Hillary Clinton foreign policy leading to destruction in another country. Yeah, there was uh, there was revenue sharing. Uh, uh, Ecuador is an oil producer. Uh, the country's very poor and the indigenous peoples of that country were starting to benefit from this revenue sharing under President Correa. But uh, again, Hillary Clinton started to foment uh, rebellions in Ecuador, labor strife, uh, almost uh, saw a police coup against the democratically elected president, Correa. And now Ecuador has uh, got a falter faltering economy, again, thanks to Hillary Clinton's uh, terrible uh, policies of uh, regime change and undermining democratically elected governments. And one of the worst people for when we talk about this is George Soros. This is somebody that Hillary Clinton has worked hand in hand with. And one of the biggest examples, I think, is the Arab Spring. Obviously, this took up a lot of countries. But I think Egypt is perhaps the best and most clear example where now we're seeing radical regime change, which Hillary Clinton supported. Yeah, we so under Hillary Clinton, we saw the uh, Mubarak government overthrown. Now, look, that wasn't a great government, but it was secular in nature. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, religious freedom in Egypt, especially uh, with the uh, minority Christian cops. Uh, but now uh, that uh, what happened after Mubarak uh, was ousted, we saw the Muslim Brotherhood, a bunch of jihadists uh, under Mohammed Morsi take control. Uh, they they started to Islamicize the country. The military reacted. Now Egypt is a military dictatorship with a lot of problems, uh, uh, especially among the poor people of, of Egypt. Uh, they haven't seen any progress. Again, this is all Hillary's fault. Let's call for what it is. Uh, this didn't happen under Condoleezza Rice, and she wasn't a very good Secretary of State either. Uh, this happened under Hillary Clinton. And John Kerry, of course, is uh, continuing a lot of these uh, terrible policies because he kept in place many of uh, Hillary's um, assistant secretaries and uh, other top officials in the State Department. Yeah, and it's very important that we hold these people accountable, much like Merkel in Germany. Um, you know, Merkel is starting to have to retract some of her stances and admit that she regrets it, and then maybe she doesn't. She wants to be tolerant. But what we're seeing in Germany is a collapsed state where they're bringing in all these refugees and now they're losing a lot of their culture, a lot of their heritage, and people are getting raped in the streets, if you want to be graphic about it. But yeah. I think that, to me, Hillary Clinton kind of reminds me of Merkel as far as her domestic policy is concerned. Oh, well, uh, domestic and foreign. They're both incompetent uh, leaders. Let's call it for what it is. People say, oh, that's sexist. You just don't want women leaders. Look. Uh, I just mentioned one uh, female leader, Christina Kirchner in Argentina. She was a successful leader. She helped spur that country's economy. And then Hillary worked uh, against her, and ultimately her political party uh, was thrown out of power. Uh, President Rousseff, Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, was ousted uh, in a constitutional coup. Uh, much of those problems were set in motion while Hillary Clinton was uh, a Secretary of State. So all these um, uh, people uh, who charge uh, that criticism of Merkel and Hillary is sexist, why is it that Hillary Clinton uh, did so much to destroy two successful women presidents in South America, Rousseff and, and uh, Fernandez de Kirchner? And, uh, you know, I mean, they can't have it both ways. Uh, but I would, again, I would suggest Merkel and Hillary Clinton are incompetent. It doesn't matter whether they're women or not. They're, they're, they, they, they shouldn't um, have had any political power 
uh, let alone chancellorship of Germany, and now they want Hillary to be president of the United States. A total disaster for the not only their own countries, Germany and the United States, but for the entire world. And I think perhaps Haiti might be the worst example uh, uh, that I've ever seen um, of a foundation, the Clinton Foundation, taking advantage of a really sad scenario, a country that is in desperate need of help, and then they use people's emotions to basically get rich. I mean, that's what they did to Haiti. I don't want to get off of that because InfoWars has reported on that a lot of times. Yeah. But, you know, uh, real quick, you know, Wayne, just looking at these foreign policies and, and looking at some of the things that she's fomented in other countries and, and looking where America is right now, you know, I think it's very important for Americans to look at these foreign policies, what has happened in the other countries um, since these foreign policies have come down, and start looking within to think, is this really what we want from a future president to happen here? Uh, no, I, absolutely not. I, I, everything that happened uh, happened while she was only the Secretary of State. And, of course, Obama went along with a lot of this stuff because uh, he's been a pretty detached president, allowing members of his cabinet to do all kinds of things. He later says, oh, I... I, w I wouldn't have done it that way. I mean, that, that shows you his managerial skills. I would just hope that Donald Trump and his advisors read this article because he's all, uh, Trump is always hit on not having specifics. But if he can actually demonstrate where Hillary Clinton has destroyed countries as secretary of state and made the world a much dangerous place, uh, she has no defense for her past actions, believe me. She can't defend that record, but at least there's a record to point to, unlike just, you know, uh, uh, using generalities to go after her. These are very specific points, and that's why I wrote the article. Wayne Madsen of WayneMadsenReport.com, investigative reporter for InfoWars.com. Thank All right, folks, that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. InfoWars Nightly News will return, Lord willing, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Central. Until then, have a good evening. We'll see you back right here tomorrow night.